Any, yes, please. So, anyone here for the first time? Anyone here for the first time? No? Good. So now we're going to have a lecture. And we are very fortunate and happy to have His Grace Akhanda Deep Prabhu with us. Let us welcome him by loudly chanting Haribo! Please Prabhu, if you want to take a seat. And we have a very interesting subject matter today. Uh, I know many of us, we grew up in the West and the Western education is very much based on science. So then when we come in touch with Krishna consciousness, sometimes we wonder how can we connect science with the Krishna conscious theology. And so that's the topic for today. And we, I think we have a very qualified person to speak about. His Grace Akhandadi Prabhu, he is from the UK originally. And he joined there in the 70s. He's a disciple of Srila Prabhupada. And he has been engaged in many, many different services, in management, uh, in preaching. But one thing, he's trying to bring these two parts together, science and Krishna consciousness. And he has done that for many years very successfully by also teaching. And yes, he will try to bring it all together in one hour. He has actually one whole series. How many hours is it on YouTube, that series? 35. 35 hours. So he will try to condense it today for all of us. Thank you, Prabhu, for coming. Hare for that introduction. It's a self-imposed <laughs> challenge <laughs> because I uh, offered the topic, but it is a deep one. Um, and for that, we're going to do a little chanting just to help us on our way. <laughs> so we, we sing this song, Jai Radha Madhava. <coughs> Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Kunja 
So we said this topic would be how to reconcile, understand um, 
the relationship of science and Krishna consciousness. Because generally in the world, science and religion don't seem to have got on very well. And they seem to be at odds. And most folk, not just within ISKCON or as devotees, but I think it's a very common issue generally of how those with religious views or religious inclinations can reconcile um, a, a happy relationship with science. And partly that is because for many people science is, is regarded as fundamentally at least, if not um, atheistic, agnostic, to the point where it seems to be offering a physicalist. And by physicalist, I mean that there is only the physical, that there is nothing beyond that. There is no supernatural. It is all just natural. And it seems that that is the viewpoint of science. But that would be a misunderstanding. Because science is not a body of knowledge. Science is not an opinion. Science is not an interpretation. Science is a process by which we gain an understanding of aspects of this world. And when we actually, what I will hope to present is that when we actually understand what is the scientific method, we see that it is application not just in helping us develop a little technology, a little better medicine, a little better ways of doing things in this world, but actually it can contribute to our understanding of spiritual existence. And indeed, the scientific method fits well within the process that we call bhakti yoga. So that's the... Uh, aspiration that I hope to uh, present now and I there's plenty of room for um, giving uh, or for me maybe creating some misconceptions or not being clear on some point so we'll try and leave enough uh, time for some questions and uh, discussions so the the word science of course in the English language and how oh, it's, was it, Wissenschaft, is it the German? Um, this is quite recent. Really, we're talking pretty well 17th century when a type of way of knowing about things through the experimental process um, developed. But actually, in Sanskrit, we generally regard this word began. Gyan means knowledge, and vigyan means realized knowledge meaning that it is knowledge that we have come to um, appreciate as true because it has been val validated in a certain way. And really that's what the scientific method is all about. It's trying to validate why we should ex believe in something. And generally with science, um, the scientific method is a way of looking at the world and modeling our experience of it. And that is different from saying that science is telling us what the world is, where it comes from. It's not telling us that. It's telling us how we can model our experience of it. Simple example, we drop something, we see it fall. We give it the idea that there's some attraction between that object and the earth. We give it the title, gravity, and we start to measure. There is an, it seems to be a force, because a force is something that gives acceleration to a mass. And we can measure the, that acceleration, 9.8 meters per second per second. So we have modeled something we have observed. But to this day, does anyone understand what gravity is? No. We're still arguing, is it a wrinkle in space-time? Or is it quantum based? There isn't a theory actually to understand what uh, gravity is, but no matter. It models, the idea models 
what we see happening, and it is very useful um, because we can calculate all sorts of things using that modeling. So scientific modeling is very, very useful and should be appreciated in that way. Now, some people then extrapolate, thank you very much, uh, extrapolate this and try to explain the difference between a religious process and a scientific process and saying that <coughs> science tells you how things work. It tells you the how about the world. Whereas religion is trying to tell you the why. Why are things like that? And why is, it's true, certainly why is a harder question for science to answer. They usually like to pass on those questions. But I think there's a closer relationship. I find myself increasingly um, opposed to just uh, ways in which religion and science just want to kind of cohabit together in an easy relationship or an uneasy relationship. I find that not satisfying <laughs> because I think there's a much closer integration that is needed for both science and spiritual life. And that's what I hope to pass on, um, uh, give some ideas today, and I'd be very interested to hear feedback. Because I know even as Hare Krishna devotees, we have a rough relationship with science. Some of it appears to come from um, statements of our own devotees, and even Srila Prabhupada at times seemed to be quite strong in terms of um, condemning theories that he didn't think were beneficial for human society because they gave a small time view of the world. They tried to narrow people's minds down. They tried to um, make statements beyond what can be proved that we only have this one life from birth to death and that's it. <coughs> Prabhupada didn't like such statements in the name of any philosophy or in science. So at times he appeared to be very strong, but actually Prabhupada's vision was rather broader and it was brilliant. It was to see this integration and that's why he um, uh, inaugurated the project in Mayapur, the temple of the Vedic planetarium. And within that uh, temple, and I've been working at different times on this project over the years, um, the understanding was that there should be a wonderful museum. And that museum should present science and Krishna consciousness together. And a better understanding of how they work together, how they integrate. Recently, um, uh, I was involved with some uh, workshops because um, I be, the governing body of our movement uh, asked those in charge of the temple and the museum to integrate more closely with the Bhaktivedanta Institute. The Bhaktivedanta Institute is one of three organizations that Srila Prabhupada set up. He instituted three organizations. ISKCON, of course you know. That's the international confederation of all our temples and centers and projects and by far the largest element of Prabhupada's mission. But then there's the Bhaktivedanta Book Trust, separate from ISKCON, which looks after all the book publishing on behalf of Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada wanted that separate so that um, both can go on unimpeded by each other. And the third institute that Prabhupada set up was the Bhaktivedanta Institute. Specifically, there was different titles, but Bhaktivedanta Institute for Higher Studies. Meaning that this was the area in which he wanted his devotees involved in science, in the philosophy of science, in understanding how Krishna consciousness works, understanding our metaphysics, understanding all those tricky purports and texts in the Bhagavatam that talk about Sankhya philosophy and that we just quickly read over because <laughs> we're not quite sure what, what the relevance of all of that is. 
but he wanted us to study all these deeply so that we have a contribution to make not just being seen as a religious movement but being seen as a movement of knowledge of comprehensive knowledge that in covers all directions covers all bases in last June I was at a conference at New York University of the uh, Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness because consciousness is kind of my thing and uh, we were having a workshop uh, looking at some of the various theories of consciousness and there are many many theories of consciousness and not one of them is considered to be uh, satisfactory um, in explaining uh, where consciousness comes from surprise um, but there was one of the neuroscientists who made a statement and she was a little concerned that perhaps you know too many people are speculating about consciousness and really things need to be properly grounded in science so she made the statement I think all the philosophers dealing with uh, consciousness they should all be well trained in physics and you know there was a good, there was a murmur of uh, assent around uh, the room you know, people, yeah, that makes sense and then I spoke and suggested well actually I think it's important to recognize that science itself is a branch of philosophy it is a branch of philosophy philosophy means seeking the truth desire to understand the truth so science emerged from a philosophical tradition it chose to adopt a particular methodology which tightened its scope of reference because it tightened it down to those things which you could control in a controlled experiment and those things which allowed others to replicate that that becomes part of the, the key aspect of the scientific method and that's fine but when you reduce the scope of what you can look at you're, you have to acknowledge that science cannot deal necessarily with broad reality it cannot deal with everything it is a very specific branch of philosophy especially you know with self-imposed constraints and within that it can be brilliant but by definition it cannot even touch anything beyond outside of its own constraints out of its own outside of its own boundaries for that you stray into back into philosophy again you're back in the philosophical field so the point we were making is that since science is actually a branch of philosophy and specifically all the interpretations given to neuroscience data and experiments are essentially philosophical interpretations not scientific science can only give you data it has to be interpreted that's philosophy so science never is useful except in very simple technology things but in terms of understanding the world science is never separate from the philosophical understanding which tries to make sense of what that data is telling us therefore I made the point actually it's the physicists who need to be better trained in philosophy <laughs> And that received a bit of a cheer. <laughs> because it's putting things in the right context. We've got to be very careful. Science is extremely brilliant at building up technological information. And it's just throwing out one gadget after another at us. So we all go, wow, this is pretty amazing. You know? And in that respect, it is. But in terms of how do we understand the bigger picture in which science is illuminating certain um, activities that we see around us how do we 
understand that bigger picture. That's philosophy. So, when we were, um, uh, a couple of months ago, when the uh, governing body asked um, the museum to, do, they, uh, they were concerned that they hadn't, the museum hadn't developed the uh, science input and science integration well enough. So they asked us to um, have much closer working relationship with the Bhaktivedanta Institute. And that's kind of preoccupied me in recent months. Um, and we had several workshops in order to look at um, the material that was being produced for the museum um, and to evaluate whether it had the right tone, if it had the right message, if it was um, clear and logical and uh, any uh, scientifically valid as well as philosophically valid. So we had a look at it and we had to really look deeply at this issue in, for the movement of how science and Krishna consciousness work together. And to do that we went back to um, the teachings of our uh, Acharyas, of the great teachers in the line um, of ISKCON, and particularly to the writings of the Goswamis, and specifically Jiva Goswami, who Srila Prabhupada regarded as probably the greatest Vaishnava philosopher, because in his um, treatise, which is called the Shat Sandarbha, the, uh, the six treaties. He lays out all the metaphysics and philosophy and epistemology and theology of Krishna consciousness all woven together. Utterly brilliant uh, analysis. And he starts it by looking at how can we know things. And the Vedas have always had um, an, uh, in any kind of the schools of Vedic thought, there's always been a certain, what they call epistemology. How do we know what we know? And sometimes it's, you know, uh, people glaze over when you start philosophy with, well, how do we know what we know? Because, you know, oh God, we're going to uh, discuss that for half an hour or, uh, uh, or months, and we never get to actually hearing anything that we could know. So it's, practically speaking, generally for the public, it's the most boring element of philosophy. So, but it is worth us spending a couple of minutes on. <laughs> How do we know? And the, the Vedas always talk about pramanas, evidences. What are the ways in which you would establish something being true and valid for you? We all do it every day. We, uh, and we use these three methods. Sometimes there's described as more than three, sometimes six, but they're really all part of these three. And the first one is pradyaksha. Pradyaksha means directly seen. What you observe. Now we know sometimes we see things and we get confused and we make mistakes. You know, we're not, you know, it's not perfect, but we do rely on it a lot. You know, we can't move around in a room or anywhere without being pretty sure, yep, the floor's there, <laughs> door's over there, you know. We're using projection all the time. So, direct perception. Then the second one is anumana. That means, anu means what follows. So, anumana means what's the inference that you draw from what you observe, right? You know? I see smoke on the far hill, perhaps there's a fire. That's inference. I can't see the fire, but I can see the smoke, and generally smoke and fire go together. So perhaps that's what it is. But I may be wrong, it might have been just a cloud, you know, a little bit of mist. So I can still make mistakes there. And the third one is Shabda, testimony. And this goes all the way from very simple up to very high shabda. Often, as devotees, we, I know, we tend to think shabda means shastra, it means the texts, it means 
Um, you know, what's written in our authoritative books, the Vedas and the Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, that, sure that is Shabda. But the Vedas themselves look at it very broadly. And one of the examples that is given in Vedanta is you come to the river and it is flowing and you're wondering how do I cross the river? There's no bridge. So you see a local resident and you ask him, is it okay to cross the road, to cross the, uh, the, the river at this point? And he says, wouldn't do it here. Do it here. It's safe, you know, shallow. You'll be able to walk across. So you do that. Shabda. You've heard something authoritative from someone who knows. And it's always said that that person has to be honest. Has to be someone who is non-envious and who will not be, he's not there to cheat you. He's there for your welfare, he or she. So Shabda comes from authority, someone who knows and someone who has your welfare and who is trying to give you good advice. So that's sometimes considered descending knowledge. In one sense, you didn't work it out for yourself. You could have tried to cross the river in many parts. And if you hadn't drowned, you might have found, eventually found the right spot that would have worked better for you. You know, you could have used inference. You could have said, well, the water seems to be flowing slower here. You know, that means it's probably deeper. You know, so here it's going faster. Maybe it's shallower. You know, you could have used inference. So it's wider. Uh, maybe the water is more. You know, you could have tried all that. And you may have got it right. But how simple was it? just to receive from someone who already knows. And if anyone is involved in the academic world and you tell your supervisor, I'm going to be studying for my master's or my PhD and I want to uh, look at this, that and the other, what will they tell you first? Go and read everything about it. Do the literature review. Find out what everyone else has said about that subject. And then start your research. Shabda is valued. So, in one sense, this harmonization, it's not that pratyaksha is bad because our senses are limited, they're imperfect, they can make mistakes, you know? We sometimes get illusioned by what we see or hear or something, you know? So it's not that pratyaksha is bad, it has its limitations. But it's generally acting very well for you. Your theorizing can go haywire. <laughs> you can really make mistakes at times. You can misinterpret a situation or something you're hearing very easily. But it doesn't mean it's bad and useless. And Shabda, where do we get knowledge from? Who are we hearing from? Who are we trusting as being valid sources of knowledge? And this is where the Vedas come in. Basically, the Vedic process is to tie these three together. Not think of them as separate. Not just as devotees, we follow Shastra and we don't worry about what we see, we don't worry about what we think. No. That is not a healthy <laughs> way to operate. And it is not going to bring you to, back to Krishna. That will not bring you back to Krishna, as we will explain. So. Harmonization of these three pramanas, that's the key. That is what Jiva Goswami is talking about. Now we do give a special regard to Shabda in this case because the Shabda of the Vedas helps to see the bigger picture of what we are observing. And that's a crucial aspect for science. Science is becoming more and more focused on the minutiae, the, the smallest aspects, a very tight area of knowledge. You know, it's becoming more and more specialized. And you know the joke about specialization. You know, more and more about less and less until you know absolutely everything about nothing. You know, that's the way it goes. You know, but that's natural specialization. So, Without Shabda, the danger for science, and if there has been a tendency, perhaps this is where the tendency has come in. And perhaps this is where the big, if you like, if not argument, at least um, 
uh, dichotomy or between science and a spiritual process is that without Vedic Shabda we might have a very narrow small vision we might be looking at the small picture I had a, a chat with um, we while we were in Gainesville uh, recently we had a visit from uh, the director of the River Phoenix uh, Institute um, they do a lot of work on um, uh, conflict resolution and, and training of uh, uh, leadership around the world. It was set up after the death of River Phoenix by uh, his mother and this gentleman who is now um, uh, the stepfather. And so he was very interested to know what we were doing. And we were explaining this aspect that what we are trying to do within the Bhaktivedanta Institute is help science see in all its knowledge. We are not confronting data. We are not confronting what has been experimentally demonstrated. That's not the issue. We're saying see it in a bigger picture. When you are looking at neuroscience results and you see all these nice pretty pictures from fMRI scanners, you know, lighting up different parts of the brain and you're analyzing this, that and the other, you know, understand what that is demonstrating and understand that is part of a picture which includes mind beyond that and consciousness beyond that. You need to see those in the bigger picture because the worst problem for neuroscience and in the way it presents itself is that it kind of thinks that an electron or a charged ion jumping from one neuron to another represents a conscious event. No. And it's trying to kind of equate simple electrical activity in the brain with actual conscious experience. Now that's an interesting subject we can go on from, and we're going to do it. Okay, we're going to do it. This is a quick demonstration to show you the problem. And maybe, you know, I hope you get it. Has any, the floating finger. I've done it with some of the devotees before. You just about that much between your fingers and you hold it about six inches in front of your eyes, look through it, and you start to see that there's a floating finger. Yeah? If you can't see it, maybe your hands, your fingers are too close, or bring them apart so that you start to see that finger coming in and out. Yeah? Mm. You know? Everyone seeing their floating finger? If maybe it's too far away from your eyes, maybe you need to bring it closer. Everyone should be able to see it, right? You're seeing an illusion, aren't you? You see a floating finger. A little thing there. Is, it, is there a floating finger in front of your eyes different from this one and this one? No, of course not. But you are seeing it. How is that? Now you can say, well, this eye is getting a little bit of this finger and this eye is getting the whole finger and similarly like that. Now, the brain's mixing it up. No. Think what's happening. Light from this one is going into this eye. Light from here is going into this eye. Separate. They're going to the back of the brain. Two separate signals. They haven't mixed yet. So in the brain, what are you going to get? Just a pattern of electrical activity, isn't it? And you might say, well, the mixing is done in that pattern. But you saw a picture. You saw a floating finger, an image of a floating finger. Where's that image? See, the floating finger has qualia, has qualities. Qualities which are not the outside world, because there's no floating finger there. So you experience something which is internal, as a picture. But the brain doesn't have any pictures in it. So that's why mind is not the brain. And who was observing it? You. You are not either the brain, nor are you Qualia, you're not the mind. So very simply, we've got three factors of consciousness happening. You, the conscious observer, 
The brain processing stuff from the world and the mind integrating that information and presenting it to you as a picture. The mind acting as interface between you, the conscious entity, and the brain. That's the bigger picture. And that's the bigger picture that has to be understood from philosophy, from the Vedas, in order to help neuroscience make any sense of what it's looking at. And the same goes for biology. Are we just machines that process energy? That's the basic definition of life. We're just a biological machine that somehow gets in the way of the sun's rays before it just hits the earth and does nothing useful. You know, this biological entity gets in the middle of this and converts that energy into a met metabolic process by which it can maintain chemicals in this really complex structure called an organism and can keep all these incredible processes going for some time and then bang, gone. As if we never existed. That's the small picture. But the Vedas explain that actually the presence of the Atma, that conscious entity we've just been talking about, has potency, has power to drive the processes of the chemistry of this body in such a way that they maintain complex structure and complex interactions and functions which power the physical body as long as the presence of that Atma is in touch with it. So the Vedas are giving us a bigger picture of what life is. Not just for humans, but the Vedas have been giving the bigger picture that all life is the result of the Atma, that conscious being in that physical body, giving it life, making it want to do things and survive and to enjoy and to connect. And science recently has at least started to explore the presence of consciousness in, um, in animal creatures. You know? I know uh, one devotee was raising this, just she was bewildered. How is it? Surely everyone understands consciousness, you know? If there's life, there's consciousness, you know? And the answer is no, I'm afraid no. <laughs> That's, uh, that's a perspective that actually comes from two sources. One, it's, of course, revealed in the, the Vedas, but actually it also comes from personal development of a spiritual process through yoga, particularly through bhakti yoga. You start to appreciate life in all its forms. There's a very interesting verse in the 11th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And it says this, by your pratyaksha, by your inference, by your anumana, by, so by your direct perception, by your uh, inference, by the shabda that you receive, and by your atma samvit, by your own realization, you should come to the conclusion that this world is asat. That, the very simple word asat, but it actually has a lot of different kind of aspects to it. It means that this world is temporary, it's changing. You are not, you are still the same person viewing it, but the world is changing at every moment. You do not change at every moment. You are still the same conscious entity when you came into this, <laughs> this temple uh, room and at this moment. You remain constant as the experiencer, as the uh, atma. But the world is changing. And that something that's changing has a source. And what is that source? Get to the bottom of that source. So the Bhagavatam is asking you to use your pramanas together to understand the nature of reality. The bigger picture of reality. And that's what we're going to try and do within this museum to glorify what can be understood through our different ways of knowing of which science is a major player. And therefore, where there is 
true study and research and people are objectively trying to understand how things work and how things are connected and what is the causality between things, that has to be applauded. There is no argument on that. But from that pratyaksha, let the anumana, let the inference be informed by the bigger picture that the Vedas give us. So we have found when we have a team of many, many devotees, um, I think there's over 100 devotees, 50 of them with PhDs, etc., already within our network and more kind of wanting to join. What we've seen is that the more the devotees appreciate how the big picture works from the, um, the messages of, particularly from the Srimad Bhagavatam, then they're able to see how the science that they are specifically involved in, whether it's biology, some neuroscience, physics, cosmology, how all of that is starting to make sense. With the help of Vedic um, authority, a Vedic knowledge, you can start to make sense of all the scientific knowledge that we have at our disposal. And without it, it's just mysteries all the way. I mean, at the end of the conference in New York, we had four days of it, hearing this, that and the other. And I spoke to David Chalmers, who was the, uh, the guy who coined the hard problem of consciousness. Um, and he, he, we were discussing after one debate, which really didn't seem to go anywhere. He said, problem is, they've got no theory of consciousness. No theory. Never mind evidence to say this, that, or, that, or anything about it. There's not even a theory that, that is workable for them. Because they're trying to work within the small picture that we're going to get the brain to explain consciousness. And as long as that's your limitation, self-imposed limitation, no one asked you to be so tight. No one said it has to be like that. But you've accepted that that's the limitation you want to impose on your understanding. Therefore, you're blinding yourself to everything else. Because I want it to be like this. That's why there is no satisfying... Um, definition to consciousness because the science community or many of them are trying to say we need a, um, a definition of consciousness that explains how it comes from the brain and that's not how science should work it needs some help from philosophy saying no you just need a philosophy of the source of consciousness <laughs> don't constrict it in a particular way before you've tested that <clears throat> so and the same with understanding life life is the presence of consciousness within a biological organism it needs to be appreciated like that we are looking at the aspects of cosmology and particularly what's called cosmogony the origins of the universe now a few years ago um, the message on that was you can't ask what happened before Big Bang because space and time started at that point. And if there's no space and time before, there's nothing before it. Then people began to realize that you can't have this kind of beginning point of what they call a singularity because quantum physics breaks down. And actually, what seems to emerge from that point are... Um, factors of uh, physics which are so finely tuned where the constants of particular aspects are very precise in order for the, the rest of physics to work and the cosmos to form. So it's a fine, called a fine tuning problem. So therefore people think, well, there's got to be something before the universe that explains all this information, all this specific um, way that the beginning point is so carefully balanced and tuned. Where did all that information come from? And now you've got all the theories of cyclical universes, um, big bounce, 
uh, what uh, Penrose's cyclical conform conformal cyclical universe and the multiverse. You know the idea that there are so many universes trying to start. Most of them are useless because they can't get the parameters right. This one did, and that's why we're lucky to be here. That, that you know, there's nothing wrong with having a theory like that. It's not science. That's got nothing to do with science. Because that's to do with philosophy. You're philosophically speculating on, on aspects that you'll never be able to demonstrate through the scientific method. So let's be clear. We're all in the same boat talking philosophy about what the origins are. We're not arguing with science. We may be arguing with scientists who think they uh, can uh, speak in the name of science, but actually they're strayed into philosophy. That's the problem. And therefore we have to clarify we're all talking philosophy. Now, what do you say? That there is two options here. That everything somehow or other is chance orientated. That there's no causality. Yeah, but everything else within the universe you have just analysed as cause and effect through the scientific method. But when it gets to that point, you're now saying there's no causality. It's all chance. That doesn't seem to be consistent as a philosopher. But I'm a scientist. No, no, you're a philosopher. But not a very good one. <laughs> so philosophers should be consistent. Whereas the Vedic point of view is trying to give the big picture even in which this cosmos is a small part. And that big picture is a realm of consciousness of which we are individual little tiny bits acting in this world. But actually, there is a huge realm of consciousness beyond this. And it is informing the complexity by which each universe comes into being for a time and is wound up. And it's explaining how each body that takes birth within this uh, universe comes into being because of the presence of the Atma and offering that opportunity. And then the Atma moves on. So the bigger picture. So in this way, um, and I, I want to conclude at this point, um, just so that uh, we can take a few comments and questions. So the understanding is that we harmonize Pratyaksha, Anumana and Shabda. They're not in argument. We harmonize science with philosophy and particularly appreciate that the scientific method is a, way, a Vedic way of knowing. It is not that there is si Vedas and there is science. Science is a Vedic way of knowing because it uses the Pratyakshas, it uses Anumana and it uses Shabda, but in a very tight way. And that's fine. Nothing wrong with being tight in your epistemology. You're defining what your method is, you're defining therefore your area of expertise and what you can illuminate. We do the same. We um, explain our epistemology of bhakti yoga as trying to connect our consciousness with the supreme source of knowledge, Krishna. And through that, creating a flow of revelation which illuminates us. That's a different epistemology. But it is also based on pratyaksha because in Krishna consciousness, no one is asked to believe in anything that you cannot prove for yourself. And I'll repeat that. No one is asked to believe in anything in Krishna consciousness that you cannot prove for yourself. Everything that is contained in the Bhagavad Gita is provable directly for yourself. And that's why Krishna says, Pratyaksha avagamam dharmyam sasukam kartam avyam in the Gita. That this knowledge is directly perceived. You prove it to yourself. You run the experiments. Do a bit of literature review as well. It's always good to get started. The literature review is, is the Bhagavad Gita, the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Prabhupada's books. But then put the practice, put the science into uh, practice. The processes of bhakti yoga, the chanting of this particular mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Ram Hare Hare. The engagement 
in a loving connection with Krishna. Now this might seem, that doesn't seem a very sensible scientific method. Doesn't, you know, doesn't seem, where's my test tubes? Where's my electronic equipment? You know? <laughs> no. But we're using the most valuable and most sensitive uh, um, equipment we have. Our own consciousness. Ultimately everything that you do in this world can only be understood by you as the conscious being, by your own consciousness. So why not tune your consciousness to the highest degree and engage it directly in a flow of knowledge and wisdom and inspiration from the source um, of all knowledge. That's our process. And a lot more can be said on that. But let's take uh, stop at that point and we've got any questions. Is there um, a way of... Um, <clears throat> Hare Krishna, thank you for the speech. Um, I'm confused uh, um, with sometimes with this topic. I would like to understand um, if everything uh, of the outside world appear in our consciousness. Um, it means that there is no separation. There is no separation and uh, um, if uh, Everything is in our consciousness. It means that we create the world that we see. That's, this is a topic that always confuses me. Like, we create the world or we don't create the world. Like, um, so it means that we are completely the creator of uh, what everything happened or not. Yes, thank you. All right, well, you've just probably raised the <laughs> biggest set of questions on philosophy. That is possible. But I'm going to give you a quick answer, which I hope w works for the moment, because there may be other aspects that we want to look at. We perceive things in the world which come through us to our senses and are presented to us in our mind. Our mind has its own limitations. It cannot represent everything to us. At this moment, my senses and mind can only represent what's in this room. Very little of what's beyond, maybe a noise or two. There are ways to extend that, but generally that's, I'm only getting a limited picture of the world. So there's a bigger world out there than I'm experiencing. That's the first thing, right? Now, I may not even be experiencing it correctly. I may only be experiencing to a partial degree. And there is um, a, a concept in the Vedas that says, according to where the Atma is, in, how it's embodied in different creatures, it will have a different level of consciousness and then experience reality in a different way. We experience this world in a particular way with the, with the shapes, the colors, the smells and things. The, and we are able to talk about it enough that we think that, oh, that's the way it is for everyone. But another creature, bring a dog in here, and it's smelling com something completely different. You know, we're starting to smell the bacorus osmosis went from down, you know. We're the, the Sunday feast is starting to come through to us. But the dog is picking up on all sorts of other things that we don't have. So its reality is different. And therefore, as far as it's concerned, practically speaking, it, you know, it is indifferent to what you think is out there. So. We, we have to be very careful of what's called naive realism. There is a world out there, it's, and I'm experiencing part of it, and I should accept the way I'm ex experiencing it. And it's valid. But at the same time, don't think that's all there is. And don't think that other states of reality cannot exist. They can. Now, am I participating in it? Well, in two ways. One is that I make, once uh, ever the world is presented in my mind to me, I'm making a certain judgment about it. And I might look at the situation, think, oh, all these people terrify me, look at them, you know, they're all watching me here, this, this is awful, you know. That's, I'm creating a self-imposed subjective experience of it. 
Whereas they could be here thinking, I'm among, among friends, you know? This is a wonderful, warm group of people, you know? What could be nicer? So we, we do subjectively experience things in our mind. Now, in another way, we are also participants. And this is perhaps the biggest difference between Krishna consciousness and every other theology on the planet. Every other theology believes that God created the world. Basically, you know, a God says, okay, let there be a world, let there be light, let there be this, you know. Now, okay, we need some people. Okay, bing, you know, and it starts to create people. So then we arrive and go, what, what, what's the, you know? And we look around and think, well, actually, there's some nice things in this world. But there's also some really nasty stuff. And there's some things that aren't, and, and I don't like this idea that, you know, I'm only here for a little while and then I kind of go through all sorts of troubles, diseases and pains. Who made, who made this world? Who did that? God? What, did he actually know what he was doing? You know? It's a big question. But that's not our view. Our view is co-creation. The Atma, the, the conscious being, is eternal. Not just within this body, not just moving from this body into through reincarnation. Eternal, it's non-temporal. You existed before time, before space, before this cosmos. You've always been, you know? You were part of that state that existed at the dawn of this universe. <clears throat> You, all of us, all the living entities who were in this universe at that time gathered together and all our desires, all our karma, all our destinies then were to be unfolded within the myriad of lives that we have had in this, in this universe. We are the co-creators. If, if we have a problem with anything in this universe, do you know who we can blame? Ourselves. Eko Bahunam Yovadadati Kaman, says the Vedas. That there is one Nityo, one eternal being who is in charge of all the other eternal beings who are Chaitanya. And that one eternal being is fulfilling the desires of the other. So this universe is created to fulfill our desire, our pre existing desire. Set of desires, actually, not just one with lots. And that's why we're going through many, many births this, this sort of mind. We're trying everything. We're having a go at everything that's on, uh, on tap in this universe. You know? And we're creating havoc for ourselves and for others in the process. And then we turn around and blame that all on God. No. We're the ones making the mess. So that's the big difference. I don't know if that's interesting. Thank <laughs> you. Know you. Thank you, Eric. Any other thoughts? <coughs> We're good? <laughs> Alright, well thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Akandadi Prabhu. His Grace Akandadi Prabhu Ki Chai. Yeah, thank you so much. I think there's no no person who can present it so elaborately like you did. Thank you so much. And again, I mentioned before the class, if you like, you can go, maybe you're interested to hear more. On YouTube, you find a series of lectures. It's called the Atma Paradigm. Probably speaking 35 hours about this kind of topic and if you're interested please check it out. Now there's going to be a vegetarian feast outside, you're all welcome to take part in this. And at 6.15 there will be a Japa meditation in this temple room. You can learn how to pray on meditation beads and then at 7 o'clock we'll have another ceremony, Arati with Kirtan and at 8 o'clock also more kirtan. So please join us and thank you for coming. Hare Krishna.